Hello everyone and welcome to my video tutorial on introduction to graph theory using Python and Network X. This is the third class of a series graph connectivity. My name is Innocent Okoloku. Objective of the class today to introduce the following concepts in graph theory. Subgraphs and supergraphs, matrix representation of graphs, adjacency and incident matrices, graph isomorphism and its determination from the adjacency matrix, connectivity, paths, circuits, cycles, connected graphs and digraphs, trees and spanning trees, vertex connectivity, edge connectivity, motivation. A good knowledge of the concepts listed in the objectives stated is essential for understanding some details of network and graph theory. There are also practical applications of the concepts covered. Learning outcomes. At the end of a session, participants should be able to describe and generate subgraphs and supergraphs, describe and create adjacency matrix of a graph, describe and create the incidence matrix of a graph, describe and determine isomorphism be between graphs, describe and generate paths, circuits, and cycles from graphs. Describe and analyze connected graphs and digraphs. Describe and analyze trees and spanning trees. Describe and analyze the concepts of vertex connectivity. Describe and analyze the concepts of edge connectivity. Content. We will look at more definitions subgraphs and supergraphs, matrix representation of graphs, adjacency matrix, incidence matrix, graph isomorphism, determine isomorphism from adjacency matrix, connectivity, paths, circuits and cycles, connected graphs and digraphs, trees and spanning trees. Now let's look at more definitions. A bipartite graph G equal to x, y, e is a simple graph in which the vertices can be partitioned into two sets x and y such that every edge is between a vertex in x and the other set of vertices in y. So it looks like this. Here we have a graph that contains six vertices and it has been partitioned into two sets. So this is one set of vertices and this is the second partition of vertices we can call this X and we can call this Y so you can see that the vertices in X are not connected at all there is no connection between them and the vertices in set Y are not connected at all the only connection or the only edges are connecting vertices between the sets so this is what we call a bipartite graph a complete bipartite graph indicated by this K subscript M and N is also a bipartite graph but in this case the M vertices in X and the N vertices in Y each of them has a, a, a connection between them there must be connection between every vertex in X and every vertex in Y so it's like a complete graph between the two sets of the bipartite graph. So we we'll look at examples of two complete bipartite graphs here. So the original graph contains the same six vertices and we have two different partitions. So this is also X and the other one is also Y. Now you can see why this is complete and the first example is not complete. Every vertex in X is connected to every vertex in Y so it's complete in that case for this example we we'll call it case subscript 33 bipartite graph this is not the only way we can partition we could have also partitioned the graphs into two on this side two vertices on, on the X side and four vertices on the y side. The same way to, for it to be a complete graph, every vertex on the x side must be connected to every vertex on the y side. 
the union of two graphs G1 union G2 is just equal to the union of the vertices of G1 and G2 and the union of the edges of G1 and G2. The orientation of a simple graph is when the edges of a simple graph like this are replaced by directed edges which we now call arcs. So this is the original simple graph and this is an orientation. We call it an orientation because we just put direction arrows to turn this ordinary graph into a digraph. So this is one example of an orientation of a graph. We could have changed the arrows to something else and that would be another orientation. Meaning that for each simple ordinary graph, we can create an orientation of the graph by defining a set of directed arcs for all the edges of the original graph. So a tournament is used interchangeably with the world orientation. That's why we say this is the tournament or the orientation of G. So if I give you a graph and say create an orientation for, for this graph, you should be able to make something out of it just by changing the undirected edges to directed edges facing whichever direction. You get an orientation. And this has practical applications. A cyclic graph is a graph in which all the vertices are connected in a ring fashion. Each edge connects only the two adjacent vertices. So what we have here is a cyclic graph. And it also has very practical applications. Now let's look at a compendium of graphs that have been built into Network X. Predefined graphs that we can generate by using Network X in Python. We'll call this program a compendium of G.py. As usual, we import Network X and Matplotlib. So we start. We say b equal to nx dot complete bipartite graph. We are calling a method inside the network x library. So for this complete bipartite graph, we are dividing it into two parts. The first set of vertices is four, and there are five other vertices. We can also create something called a cycle graph, cyclic graph, the one I just described before, that has five nodes of vertices. We can also create a path graph. A path graph is like a line graph. It's like a cycle graph in which the first and the last vertices are not connected to each other. So it doesn't matter the physical structure of the path graph. The path graph may be going around, but as long as the first node and the last node are not connected to each other, it is also a path graph. Whether it is straight, whether it is curved, whether it is shaped in zigzag, as long as the first node is not connecting to the last node and the edges connect only adjacent vertices, then it is a path graph. We also have a star graph, as the name implies, where you have one node in the middle and every other node is connected to that node alone. It's a star graph. We also have a cubical graph. And then let's start showing them. So here we are going to see several ways of drawing them. First of all, we can use a, a method from the Network X library to organize the way the drawing will look like. So we have one of them is shown here, it's called Spring Layouts, using layouts. So what Spring Layout does is, is like the way it's going to plot the graph, it treats the edges like springs. And then it treats the nodes like some things that are attached to the end of the spring. So in the plotting window, what this spring layout attempts to do is make sure that each two nodes attached to an edge are separated as much as possible, like the spring is pushing them apart. That's what the spring layout does. You can explore Network X and see all the various layouts that they have available and try them. So we want to plot all of these graphs into a single window and we are going to use subplot to do that. So I don't know whether I've explained subplots before, but I'm going to re-explain it here if you don't mind. So we want to plot, we have uh, one, two, three, four, five graphs here, which we can plot in a single window that shows all the plots together. So our window is going to look something like this, one, two. So we want to show 
six graphs like this in a grid the first one will be here second one will be here third one will be here fourth one will be here fifth one will be here you may not put anything here but let's just put something there so if you look at this the matrix is uh, two rows times three columns that is where these two three is coming from and this is the first one this is the second one this is the third one this is the fourth block this is the fifth one and this is the sixth one so that's the first one is where this one is coming from so we see sub axis one plot sub plot two three one we are saying plot on this side and then you plot something in there we say we can also set a title before we plot sub axis one set title bipartite and then we we'll continue the program and we say nx dot draw take note of this we are going to use two method two different methods to do the drawing and then we'll see how they behave after it is drawn we are now drawing the bipartite graph and we'll call our layout function equal to nx dot bipartite layout bipartite layout check out all the layouts available for bipartite graph and then we'll put the graph here and then we specify that there are four nodes on one side we can also specify the node color if you want arrow for red we can also specify the edge color B for blue explore them and change them to different colors and see how they look like so we did that draw that is done for the bipartite graph the next is subplot 232 and we are going to set the title to circular graph and then we say draw network so take note this is draw and this is draw network later on we see the difference in their behavior we are drawing the circular graph we call the layout set the node color and the edge color the third subplot on the plot the planner p graph every other thing remains the same sub axis for the star graph so this time around for the star graph we did not even call the layout function we just set the node color and the edge color then we we'll plot the fifth one cubical one because we are going to plot two, two cubical graphs set the title we just say draw t in fact we did not even specify any further parameters the last one we take the subplot the sixth subplot and then we say set the title to cubical 2 but this time around we are using draw network x and we are setting all the parameters so can see the difference finally we say plot dot show and what do we get out of it something like this so everything shows in one window bipartite for the first one so when we just used draw we see that this black box does not cover it around that is one of the difference in behavior between draw and the uh, draw network x so the second one is draw network x this is a circular graph it goes around all the way and this is a planar graph it's actually a straight line graph see if this zero was connected to the four then it will be a circular graph it doesn't matter whether it looks like a triangle or not it is a circular graph it just went around okay but as long as this zero is not there it is a planar graph meaning that it could have been in a straight line you know just like this okay like we already know learned from previous classes the physical arrangement of a graph does not matter it is the structural connection between the nodes that defines the graph so this is our star graph and this is our cubical graph in which we did not specify any color we did not we just said draw t and then there is no black box around it and they call the nodes are not colored this is also the same cubical graph of course they don't look like the same is it not when you see graphs like this that don't look like they are the same graph it is isomorphic you can actually prove that this one is equal to this as we will see later in the class so let's go to visual studio code and run this program and see how it works so here we are in visual studio code if you don't know how to open the program please watch the previous videos this is the program that I just described and I don't need to describe it again here click run 
okay so we have our compendium of graphs right here on the screen let's look at more definitions as we progress a graph is strongly connected if any two distinct nodes of the graph can be connected via a path that follows in the direction of the edges of a graph we define a subgraph a graph h equal to wf contained in another graph gve is called the subgraph of g if and only if the set of vertices of h is a subset of the vertices of g and if the set of edges of h is a subset of edges of v so we have a graph here for example h is a subgraph of g so you will see what actually defines a subgraph is the vertices of h are inside g look at it we have one two three six five these are the vertices in h they are also inside g now we have e1 e2 e3 e4 e5 e7 e6 take note of this it is actually the vertices and the connection between them that defines a graph it's not the label you give the connection so for this particular graph e4 is actually just 2 5 that's what defines the edge and not the name or the label so this e4 here is actually the same thing as e5 here if you want to label it as e5 it doesn't matter it's up to you but what is really defining this graph is the connection between them so we say that this h is a subgraph of so if H is a subgraph of G, then we can say that G is a supergraph of H. In fact, I can give you any graph and tell you to generate a supergraph out of it or generate a subgraph out, out of it. If I say generate a subgraph out of it, just pick a set of vertices like we have done and specify the exact connection between those vertices, you get a subgraph. If I say generate a supergraph out of H, for instance, all you just need to do is create another vertex and then create connections between that vertex in fact if you create one connection and call this 7 you have created a, a super graph of H so we also talk about a spanning subgraph any subgraph P equal to MK of a graph G is called a spanning subgraph if and only if the number of vertices of P is equal to the number of vertices of G M equal to V the number of edges may not be the same as long as the number of vertices is the same and all of those vertices are connected we call it a spanning subgraph so the subgraph spans the original graph now let's look at matrix representation of graphs we we'll begin with the adjacency matrix the adjacency matrix A equal to A subscript IG of a graph G is defined as follows AIJ is equal to 1 if there exists an edge between I and J this symbol you see here means there exists and if there don't exist an edge between I and J the entry to the matrix is 0 so the matrix A for the general graph is generally symmetric not for the digraph example so we look at two different graphs here. In fact, both of these graphs are actually planar graphs. Because if you stretch it out, you get a straight line. The last two vertices do not connect with each other. So they are planar graphs. Now we are going to generate the adjacency matrix of G and see how it is. So when you want to generate the adjacency matrix, you take the nodes of the graph and you write it out like this. W, X, Y, Z and then you also write the nodes WXYZ as long as this graph has four nodes you are going to have a 4 by 4 matrix if it has five nodes you have a 5 by 5 matrix it is a square matrix that you get out of it and the square matrix is symmetric if you've learned matrices when we say the matrix is symmetric we mean that the transpose of the matrix is equal to the matrix itself but if you don't know about that don't worry about it so if we look at the definition here we say the entry of the matrix will be 1 if there is an edge going from i to j 
so this is we take w to begin with there is no edge going from w to w so that's why we have a zero here is there an edge going from w to x yes this edge and we have a one here is there an edge going from w to y no so we have a zero here from w to z no then we'll come to x from x to w yes from x to x no from x to y yes from x to z no then we'll go to y from y to w zero from y to x one from y to y no from y to z one then we'll go to z z only goes to y and it doesn't go anywhere else so that's where that's where we'll have that one here and the rest are zeros now if you transpose this matrix you get exactly the same matrix so let's look at hish the same way we did it a b c d a b c d try that yourself if there's an error with this just let me know drop it in the comment section still looking at adjacency matrix for the digraph it is a bit different so we see the adjacency matrix b equal to small b subscript ig of a digraph is defined as follows b i j the entry is one if there exists a directed edge from i to g and zero otherwise now b is not generally symmetric because of a direction as we see in the analysis here we we'll take an example we we'll look at the same graphs we saw before not exactly the same but we have created orientations for the graphs so they now have direction arrows that are pointing somewhere so let's begin with the first example in the same way we write our wxyz and we write our wxyz again this time around you will only have a one if there is a directed edge going from one point to another let's take w w does not go to w is zero w does not have a directed edge going to x so it's zero in fact w went no further then we take x x has a directed edge to w so it is one to x zero it also has a directed edge to y so it's one the rest is zero y has only a directed edge to z the rest is zero and z does not have a directed edge anywhere so if you transpose this matrix you discover that the transpose is not the same as the original matrix that is why it is not symmetric if you follow the example i just did you can generate the matrix that we have here give it give it a try and if there's any error in this matrix drop a comment below so i can fix it now there is another matrix we look at incidence matrix of a diagram in fact this incidence matrix has to do with diagraphs only so we are going to call it c subscript ij of a diagraph is defined as follow c subscript ij equal to minus one if edge j leaves vertex i otherwise it is equal to one if edge j enters vertex i that is the edge that is leaving vertex j enters vertex i and zero otherwise c is not generally symmetric we take another example and we'll try to generate the incidence matrix so we have uh, one two three four edges and we also have four vertices if we have five edges we are going to have a five by four matrix so it's not a square matrix so we label the edges here e1 and then we are going to pick it one by one the definition says that does E1 enter vertex W? Yes. So since E1 enters vertex W, we write it as 1. E1 is leaving vertex X. Leaves vertex X. We write it as minus 1. E1 has nothing to do with vertices Y and Z. In the same way, we come to E2. E2 has nothing to do with W. E1 leaves vertex Y. So we have minus 1. E1 enters vertex X. We have 1. The rest is 0. Where does E3 leave? E3 leaves X. So that will be minus 1. 
and e3 enters y that will be plus one e4 leaves y so that will be minus one and e4 enters z and that will be one so this is where we get our incidence matrix from actually the way the incidence matrix is the formula that it is defined with in network x seem to be different from this one that i got from the book so if you look at several books you will discover that the incidence matrix is defined separately differently i don't know where they are getting all the different formulas from but this is the one I found in the book we are using. However, it turns out that the one that was using Network X is different. So don't be surprised if you see it differently in other book books. However, in most of the books, all of the ones that I have read, the adjacency matrix is the same. So this matrix is also called a topology matrix. We've not considered all the matrix representation of graphs here for the class at this level. We are now going to look at a Python program that shows the matrix representation of graphs. We'll call this graph params at pi. So what we are going to do in this example is see how to use network X and Python to extract some parameters like neighbors, so on and so forth, and also perform some matrix transformations of graphs. So let's say we define the nodes, a set of nodes as a list. We have W, X, Y, Z and then we'll create a graph an ordinary graph nx.graph and we say add nodes from g nodes it is the graphs that we used before that we're trying to redefine here now so for the ordinary graph we say add edges from wx xy and yz that's the way it was defined in the diagram and for the diagram we say add nodes from the set of the same set of nodes but this time around you add the edges that correspond to the edges that we did in the diagram so you will learn from here now that the nodes doesn't have to be numbers you can also use strings and then you can also create the edges just like this first of all let's see whether we can extract some parameters from the graph if we want to show the neighbors of a particular node we can just say list g dot neighbors x the neighbors of node x that's what this part of the program does we can also print all the neighbors of every node in the graph so uh, we are now going to use a list comprehension here now we say x equal to print n comma list g dot neighbors n for n in g dot nodes so instead of writing a long for loop we use this comprehension to write it out so what it's going to do is it's going to loop through all the nodes from 0 to n minus 1 and it's going to show all the neighbors of each of the nodes as we see in the output we are not done yet to continue we can also print the edges of g so we can say print uv for u and v in g dot edges and we can generate or extract the adjacency matrix or so perform the matrix transformation for the ordinary graph we say a equal to nx dot adjacency matrix g print a equal to a dot to dense now this is a function that we we'll call to make the printing of the matrix to look like a real matrix otherwise if you print it without appending this to dense you are going to get something that looks funny in fact give it a try see what you get so that you can know the reason why we are using this to dense this one is just printing a space and then we also get the adjacency matrix of the diagram and then we also generate the incidence matrix of the diagram and we print all of them so finally we can plot a, f a figure of the graph draw the network of both graphs and we can show the plot here is a graph params that pi program so this is what we got from the plots and you can see that these diagrams are actually planar graphs because the first and the last nodes do not connect with each other so let's see the output we got G neighbors of X are W and Y. G neighbors of N are the neighbor of W is X. 
the neighbors of x w and y the neighbors of y x and z and the neighbors of z the neighbor of z is y the edges are w x x y y z only three edges the adjacency matrix of g is exactly the way we calculated it the adjacency matrix of d is exactly the, the way we calculated it and this is the incident matrix which is different from the way we calculated it because of the formula that network x is using which is different from the one we got from the book now let's look at the topic of graph isomorphism graph g1 and g2 are isomorphic that is both of these graphs are the same but graph G3 is not the same as any one of them. So G1 and G2 are said to be isomorphic, but G3 is not. What do we mean by isomorphism? I have said this several times in the course of this lecture that the physical appearance or the location of the nodes of a graph doesn't matter. It is the connectivity between them that matters. That's what actually defines what a graph is. So if you did ordinary level chemistry you will remember the topic of isomerism in organic chemistry where you have uh, some chemicals that have the same number of carbon and hydrogen and this, this, the same arrangement of connection but they don't look different they don't look the same they look different so it is similar to what we have with graphs here now if you look at this graph closely you will discover that isomorphism is determined by looking at the vertices and the connection. There is a function here that maps V1 to W1. There is a function that also maps V2 in the first graph, G1, to W4. Another function maps V3 to W3 maps v4 to w6 maps v5 to w5 and maps v6 to w2 but this is not easy to determine just by looking at the graph especially we have uh, six nodes here but we see a method of how to use the adjacency matrix to determine that as we progress so this is another complicated graph the peterson graph these three you see here, all of them are the Peterson graph, but they don't look alike at all. That's what isomorphism is. Another point you should notice, the fact that two graphs have the same number of vertices and the same number of edges does not automatically mean that they are isomorphic. They must have the same connection. That's what makes it isomorphic. Same number of vertices, same number of edges, same structure of connection even though they look physically different in the arrangement. So how do we determine isomorphism by using the adjacency matrix? We look up two graphs. The two graphs we saw before are graphs G and H isomorphic. How do we know? Of course they are the same. So we can look at the adjacency matrix of both graphs and see that they, they may look different. But is there a way we can be able to arrange this matrices so that one of them become like the other so our target now is to show that matrix ag is actually equal to matrix ah if we can prove that then we know that both of the graphs are isomorphic this is a very simple example because both of them are actually planar graphs so if you just stretch out one and stretch out the other one you just know they are the same graph however for the peterson graph it's not so easy to do that so let's start with a simple problem like this and you can apply the same principle for a complex graph like the Peterson graph and determine where isomorphism occurs between two graphs. We will use a method that is similar to something we learn in linear algebra. If you have a matrix like this, you can be able to arrange the rows and the columns. You just swap the whole row not individual items if you are moving a whole row you are moving a whole row and exchanging it with another row and if you are moving a whole column you are exchanging a whole column with another column then they will remain the same if you do it individually it will be messed up but if you move whole rows and columns it is still the same 
So for those of us who are not familiar with matrices, what is a row? Everything you see on the horizontal axis is a row and everything you see on a vertical axis is called a column. So what we are going to be doing now is row and column swapping. So if you look at the matrix of AH, you will discover that we have one and one here, we have one and one here, and then we have this one one here. Is it possible for us to arrange the AG matrix to get something like this? Of course it is. So first thing we want to do is look at where we have a one here and push it to this side. So we can have a one here. So first we start with column swapping. We pick column X and then we pick column Z and we exchange them. So we can have a zero zero on this side and a zero one on this side. If we do that swapping, we have a zero 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 one and the first row that corresponds to this first row has been taken care of. Then we'll go to the next operation. Now if you look at this matrix on this side, you discover that there is a one one somewhere. And if you look at what we have here originally, see this one that we have already done like this, we are not going to touch it anymore. We'll leave it like this. So is there any other one among all these ones where we can put a one and one together? If we look at Y and Z for instance, there is a one here and if we push the one to this side, we are going to get a one one, a one connected to this one. So let's do that. We we'll swap Z and Y again. So when we bring Y to this side, we get a one one. So you see, this one one zero zero is akin to this one one zero zero that we have here already. Okay. And in addition to that, we have a one one. See, there is zero zero one one here. And there is also zero zero one one here. So what what are we thinking? What are you thinking? If you are thinking what I'm thinking, it's like we should push this one to this position so that it will be like this, and then push this one that is here now to another position. We are going to exchange X and Y. So by the time we do this swapping, we discover that everything on the top part here has been taken care of. And what are we left with the bottom part? So the last thing remaining for us to do is just to swap these two and then we got the final part. So when you swap Z and X, what do we have? We discover that we actually got a matrix that is equivalent to the original matrix. That shows that graph G and H are isomorphic. So you can apply this principle to any graph, to the Peterson graph, whichever graph, you do it carefully and you can discover, you can decide whether two graphs are isomorphic or not. Now let's look at connectivity, parts, circuits, and cycles. We are still looking at definition. A walk or a directed walk is said to exist from a vertex I to a vertex K in a graph. If we can walk from VI to VK along some edges with no restrictions, no restrictions at all, so a walk is of the form moving along edge v1 v2 v2 v3 up to vk minus 1 vk and finally to vk that's what a walk is it's very free it has no restriction when you walk around and come back to the vertex you started from we call it a closed walk then we talk about a trail a walk becomes a trail if there is a restriction that each edge be traversed at most once. You want to pass through an edge, but you don't ever want to pass through that edge again when you are doing your work. Then it becomes a trail. That's the first restriction. When a trail is closed, you came back to the vertex you started from. Then it becomes a closed trail. A trail becomes a path if there is a further restriction that each vertex be visited at most once. Take note of a trail. The restriction of the trail is that 
each edge be traversed at most once. So when it comes to a path, you add the first restriction to the second restriction and then you get a path. So for a path, you cannot pass through a vertex twice and you cannot pass through an edge twice. That's what makes it a path. So take note of the chronology. We start from a walk, no restriction, and then we'll go to a trail, restriction and edges, and then we'll go to a path, restriction on both edges and vertices. So we also talk about a closed path. It's a path that you go around and come back to the vertex you started from. In fact, for a closed path, the only vertex you can visit twice is the vertex you started from and then you came back to the vertex. That's what we call a closed path. And we define a cycle as a closed path with at least three vertices. Let's look at an example. We we'll look at graph A, which is an undirected graph. In A, we will define a walk. So, if we start from vertex 2, and we we'll follow edge E4, and go to vertex 1, and we we'll follow edge E1, and go to vertex 4, and we we'll follow edge E2, and come back to vertex 1. And then we'll follow edge E1 again and go back to vertex 4. How many times have we visited vertex 1? Twice. And we also visited vertex 4? Twice. How many times did we traverse edge 1? Twice. So there is no restriction. As long as we can move from one vertex to another via some edges, we call it a walk between 2 and 4 in this example. You can determine other works between other vertices here. It is a work, no restrictions. Now let's put restriction and edges. We define a trail. We want to create a trail between two and three. So if we follow edge three, for instance, we'll go to vertex one. And if we follow edge one, we'll go to vertex four. And if we follow edge two, we'll go to vertex one again. And if we follow edge 4, we'll go to vertex 2 again. And if we follow edge 5, we'll go to vertex 3. So this is a trail between vertex 2 and vertex 3. So take note, there was no restriction on the visitation of vertices, or there was a restriction on the visitation of edges. That's what a trail is. So let's look at a path that has both edge and vertex restriction. So we want to create a path between vertex 2 and vertex 1. We start at vertex 2. If we follow edge 5, we'll go to vertex 3. If we follow edge 6, we'll go to vertex 4. If we follow edge 1, we'll go to vertex 1. So, this is a path between vertex 2 and vertex 1. We did not go to any vertex twice, it's not allowed. And we did not traverse any edge twice. That's what makes it a path. Now let's look at the second graph, which is a diagram. We want to create a directed walk from 1 to 6. So you see the notation for diagrams, how it is different from the one of an ordinary graph. So we start at 2. See, you can't follow in the opposite direction. So going from 2 to 1 is not possible. It's a one-way lane. We can only go from 2 to 3, from 3 to 4, from 4 to 1, from 1 to 2, from 2 to 3 again, and from 3 to 6. So we visited vertex 2 twice because it is a directed walk. There is no restriction on edges and vertices. In fact, we traverse this edge twice. So let's look at a directed trail from 1 to 3. This time around, there is going to be restriction on edges. So we start from vertex 1. We'll go to 2. From 2, we'll go to 4. From 4, we'll go to 1. 
and from 1 we we'll go to 3 so how many times did we visit 1 because there is no restriction on vertices we visited 1 twice but we did not traverse any edge twice so let's look at restriction on both edges and vertices a directed path from 1 to 7 so we start from 1 and then we'll go from 1 to 2 we will never come to 1 again and then we'll go from 2 to 5 we will never come back to 2 again and we'll never pass through 2 and 5 again and then we'll go from 5 to 7 so this is a directed path from 1 to 7 restriction on traversal of edges and visitation of vertices so we talk about the shortest path the shortest path is just the way the definition goes it's just the shortest path from one point to another in graphs where you have the edges weighted for instance if a weight is attached to this edge or a number is attached to this edge or a number is attached to this edge then we can see there are several ways from moving from vertex 1 to vertex 7 we could have gone from 1 to 3 3 to 6 6 to 5 and 5 to 7 the shortest part is which one is the lowest summation of edge weights that leads us from one vertex to another and we'll learn how to calculate that as the class progresses so it's usually denoted by using this formula summation formula we are summing the lengths of edges from i to k minus 1 to determine which one is, is going to be the lowest among all the edges that lead from one vertex to another so that is the minimum path from vi to vk in the same way we can conversely define the longest path which is strictly opposite to the shortest path definition that we just saw a Hamiltonian cycle is a cycle that contains all the vertices of G an Euler trail is one that contains every edge of G exactly once remember what a trail is you have to traverse an edge only once you can't go it the second time an Euler graph is a graph that has a closed Euler trail a tree is a graph that is connected and has no cycles so in the course of learning graph theory you are going to learn a lot about trees and just like the way the name implies a tree looks like this and then it has branches that goes like this like the definition says it is a graph that is connected and has no cycles so I have never seen a tree in which some of the branches join together at some point I don't know whether you've seen that but I haven't seen that so any graph that has no cycle in which there is no edge that is connecting two of the edges together in a loop function is called a tree whether it is upside down or it is sideways or it's standing upright it is called a tree and we see examples of them so a spanning tree is a tree that contains all the vertices of G and normally it has n minus 1 edges then we also talk about a connected pair of vertices that is straightforward and intuitive if two pair of vertices have an edge connecting them then we call them a connected pair a connected graph is a graph in which every pair of vertices in G is connected or has a connected pair otherwise it's called a disconnected graph and we can see that some graphs are actually disconnected a component of G a subgraph H of G is called a component of G if H is equal to H prime whenever H prime is a connected subgraph of G that contains H now let's look at concepts regarding the deletion of edges and graphs if a set F is a subset of E and E is in the graph VE that is F is a set of edges which is a subset of the edges in G then the subtraction of F from G which is denoted by using this formula is the graph you obtain by deleting all the edges in F 
from the edges in G. So we define a disconnecting set. The set F is called a disconnecting set if it has more than one element. If F has only one element, it is called a bridge, a cut edge, or an isthmus. We'll see examples of this later and we we'll use them extensively, so don't worry if you don't get it clearly at the moment. Then we see F is a cut set if F is a disconnecting set and no proper subset of F is also a disconnecting set. So let's look at an example here. Everything you see here is actually a graph. See? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. But it's not connected. The graph is not connected. It has several parts that are spread across several areas and there is no way to get from one part to another. Consider this a city that is made up of islands that have no connecting roads. That's one way to visualize it. So 1, 6 and 2, 6 is a disconnecting set. This is an edge, 1, 6 and this is another edge, 2, 6. It's a disconnecting set. But it's not a cut set because a proper subset is also a disconnecting set. So a proper subset of this is 2 and 6. So if we cut out 2 and 6, the graph becomes disconnected. The graph that is already disconnected becomes further disconnected. If the graph was not disconnected before it's a connected graph, this cut set if you delete any one of the edges or if you delete the edges there, you are going to break the graph apart. You are going to create separation or disconnection. This item alone is a bridge, like we described before. A bridge in the sense that only this one element is going to break this graph into two separate parts that has no connecting road anymore. You know, of course, if you look at it structurally, it looks like a bridge. You blow it apart, then this island is separated from this land. Now, if you go further down the graph, you discover that 10, 12 and 10, 13 is a cut set. No proper subset is a disconnecting set. Why so? Because if you delete any one of these, take any one of them and delete it, it's not going to create a separation in the graph. The only way you can create a separation of a graph is if you delete both of these. Then you have 10 on this side and you have 13 and 12 on the other side. Now, suppose you just deleted only one of them. You delete 10 and 13. Is this graph disconnected? No, you cannot create a disconnection. You still have a connection between 12 to 10 and 13. And suppose you deleted 10 and 12 and you left this alone. You still have a connection between this and this. So that is why this is a cut set. Because no proper subset is a disconnecting set. Now let's look at concepts regarding the deletion of vertices. Suppose W is a subset of vertices, subset of vertices in graph G. Then, if you remove the set W from the vertices of G, this is the graph you obtain by deleting W from the vertices of G we now define something called a separating set. Take note of that. Disconnecting set, separating set. Disconnecting set for edges, separating set for vertices. Or we also call it a cut vertex. W is a separating set if it has more than one element. If W has only one element, we call it a cut vertex or an articulation vertex. Now let's look at another graph, which is also disconnected. So G is a forest consisting of three trees. These are actually trees, you know, like I described trees before. A tree is a connected graph that has no cycle. So all of this is not a tree because it's disconnected. But each of them, the disconnections you have there, each of them are trees because they are connected and they have no cycles. We say an acyclic graph sometimes known as a forest, is a graph with no cycles. A tree is a connected acyclic graph. Thus, 
each component of a forest is a tree and then we also talk about a spanning tree which is an acyclic connected spanning subgraph so the following are equivalent in a graph G if we say G is a tree and we see there is a unique path between every pair of vertices in G we're also saying it is a tree uh, we say G is connected and every edge in G is a bridge it is a tree uh, we say G is connected and it has n minus 1 edges it is a tree uh, we say G is a cyclic and it has n minus 1 edges it is a tree uh, we say G is a cyclic and whenever two known adjacent vertices in G are joined by an edge the resulting G has a unique cycle. We can also define that for connectivity. Just replace acyclic with connected. And whenever two known adjacent vertices in G are joined by an edge, the resulting G has a unique cycle. So we we'll talk about vertex connectivity. Recall from our previous definition that a set W, which is a subset of vertices in graph G, is called a separating set of vertex cut if the removal of W from G has more than one component. If a separating set W has only one element, then it is called a, a cut vertex or an articulation vertex. We define the connectivity number, this scriptic KG of a graph, as the minimum size of separating set in it so a graph G is said to be K connected if the connectivity number or is greater or equal to K so what is small K here it is the minimum number of vertices in the separating set so we say K subscript N any graph complete graph is said to be N minus 1 connected for all N and a graph that is not complete is k connected if and only if every separating set in it has at least k vertices the connectivity number of a graph is zero if and only if it is either a disconnected graph or it is a trivial graph so a graph of order n is k connected if the degree of each vertex is at least n plus k minus 2 all over 2 the lowest degree of the vertex must be greater or equal to n plus k minus 2 over 2 now if this is not very clear we'll see an example in the next page before we see the example a graph is one connected if and only if there is at least one path between every pair of vertices in it example 9 we have a graph that contains six vertices first question is determine if the graph is k connected to determine this we recall that a graph is k connected if the minimum degree of the graph is greater or equal to n plus k minus 2 over 2 so n is the number of nodes in the graph we know is 6 already what about k which is the minimum size of separating set in it so k is the minimum number of vertices in the separating set so we determine this as 6 plus 2 minus 2 over 2 in which case k is 2 how do we determine that k is 2 what you do is look at the graph what is the minimum number of vertices that you have to delete from this graph to make it a disconnected graph if you delete one it's still not a disconnected graph two four five three six are still connected if you delete four it's still not a disconnected graph but if you delete two and three we'll have a separate graph on this side and a separate graph on this side which are disconnected so we needed to delete one and two vertices in order to create a disconnected graph and that's what made k to be 2 in the analysis that we have here that's the solution so how do we determine whether it is 2 connected 
we look at the minimum number of degree we have here which is 3 and 3 is greater or equal to 3 which means that the graph is actually 2 connected so we determine kg which is the connectivity number that is straightforward and we know directly that k is equal to 2 because we only need to delete two vertices from this graph to make it a disconnected graph so can you follow the same procedure and determine if the graph is three connected now let's look at edge connectivity recall that a set f of edges which is a subset of the edges in g is called a disconnecting set if the separation of a of f from the edges of g has more than one component if the disconnecting set f has only one element then it is called a bridge or a cut edge so a graph is said to be k edge connected if every disconnected set has at least k edges inside it so we define the edge connectivity number as the minimum size of disconnecting set in it minimum size of disconnecting set in it and we say that a graph g is k edge connected if this minimum size of disconnecting set in it is greater or equal to k where k is the minimum number of edges in the disconnecting set that is the minimum number of edges we need to delete from the graph to create a, a disconnected graph now let's look at witness inequality the connectivity number is less or equal to the edge connectivity number and it is also less or equal to this value you have here where delta g is the minimum vertex degree of the graph let's look at an example at the same graph we saw before determine lambda g lambda g is the minimum size of disconnecting set so how many edges do we need to delete out from this graph to make it a disconnected graph one two three so lambda g is definitely three before we can prove the witness inequality we have to determine delta g so kg from what we saw in the previous example which is the minimum size of separating set in it if we delete these two vertices delta g is equal to 3 which is the number of edges we need to delete to create a disconnected graph and delta g is the minimum vertex degree of the graph which is 3 minimum 3 so have we proved the witness inequality so lambda g is 3 kg is 2 2 less or equal to 3 less or equal to delta g which is also 3 the inequality has been proved bibliography our bibliography remains the book of balakrishnan edward platt and philippo mengsa other materials on the internet be sure to check out my youtube videos so we have come to the end of the class today please like share comment and subscribe for more videos if this video helped you to understand graph theory better recommend it to your friends share it with your friends thank you very much and see you in the next class